What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Dig It Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Walsh, and today we got another fellow New Yorker in the house, Coach H. Bod, currently lives on a plane because he's traveling all over the place. This one's going to be hilarious because of just the lineage, right? Like, this is why I love baseball so much. You might need a pen and paper to understand how this whole whole relationship started, but needless to say, my wife's best friend's family, right, their daughter, Met this guy who coached at where was it at the time? Ryan, Fairfield. Yeah. Well, Fairfield, yes. Well, Fairfield, right? Like he was a Teddy Herville, right? Yeah. Was a pitching coach at, at Fairfield. He met Lauren, who was a coach at Fairfield. They hit it off. And then he left Fairfield, went to Bryant, who we used to play in conference. Um, and then that's where this your relationship started, correct? Correct. You were an assistant coach there, and then Coach Teddy got married, went to the wedding, and I got to meet meet the famous H Bot. <laughs> and here we are today. And like, if yes, the, for the listeners, man, like, if you ever met someone where you're just like instantly like, dude, I feel like I've known you forever, and I, I've known you for about <laughs> sixty eight seconds. This is this guy right here. So, hey, Coach H Bot, I am uh, I'm 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 pumped to have you on and talk all things baseball, but. The reason why we're calling you H Bod, Coach, can you pronounce your last name, please? Yeah, it's Eric Hirschbein Bodner. That's why we're going to call him Coach H Bod because I don't know what that. It sounds very German. Yeah, German. It sounds like a type of yeah. beer. Yeah, but it we're does. gonna go. We're gonna go with H Bod. So, Coach H Bod, what is up? Nothing much, man. How's uh, how's everything? Just uh, in the thick of the good old baseball season, the fun time of year. And which one? Because you got a lot of things going on. Can you just real quick elevate a pitch, unravel your baseball history, like your lineage, sure. timeline, whatever you think is interesting and why you so, today? Yeah. So I think that my story is really interesting because, you know, out of high school, I thought, you know, I was going to had a couple of division three offers Thought I was going to go division one, did a walk on tryout, got cut. I was going to transfer. Then the coach pulled me in the office. Like, what's your goal? And I was like, I want to work in the industry. And he was like, got a better chance learning the industry than playing the industry. So I started as, you know, a student assistant at Rhode Island. I ended up coaching collegiate baseball at 20, 20 years old at Salve Regina. Coached Division three for four, Division two up at Felician in Jersey, back to Division three at Becker College, then to Bryant for five. And now, you know, I'm an agent with Octagon Baseball. And I also own an NECBL team. So got to work my way up through you that. You hate baseball, you know? huh? You don't like yeah, baseball at all? No, not That's at what all. I heard. Yeah, no, so... Uh, I think the interesting learning the ins and outs and learning every single angle of the sport from the business side to the scouting side to the coaching side. And it's just, it's evolving so fast in front of us, especially since the draft changed in 2021, 2020. So just understanding how the sport analytically business wise and everything's changing so quickly, being able to hang on to the reins and learn and kind of share that information with kids, with colleagues, with coaches, it's it's been it's a really really exciting time, and that's awesome. Let's uh let's stay with that. Your most current endeavor. Uh, we got two, but we'll we'll discuss the Octagon Sports Agency. Yeah. When when you say that, just give our listeners a little idea about how their draft changed recently. So before COVID, it was forty rounds. Then during COVID, it was five rounds. Then after COVID, it's dropped to twenty rounds. And in those twenty rounds, there's a lot of analytics that go into it a lot of you know the drafts changing on how valuable those picks are because you cut the draft in half and there's less minor league teams so scouts have a lot of pressure on them to find something better than they have already in their system obviously age is a huge factor what they're judging analytically is huge and that's something that changes year by year and i think what's the most interesting is you know you look at certain teams and like one one thing that i study a lot is teams in the playoffs, right? Like every team's goal is to win a World Series, right? And if you look at it, certain things change. Like, you know, a couple of years ago, everyone was saying power, power, power. And you look at teams and at, at the end of the season, what do they have? They have bullpen, guys that get on base, guys that play defense and guys that run. And all of a sudden you can see guys changing in the draft going from that power. Yes, you're always going to take the donkey that hits 30 home runs, but now you're seeing more athletic speed. And I think that changing the bases to a bigger base that is, you know, evident in itself. Like stolen bases are up across the league. Runs being created are up across the league. With the games being shorter time-wise due to the new regulations, you know, what do, what do guys want to see? What do the fans want to see? Because baseball is a business. 
You know, they don't like seeing base to base. They like seeing home runs. They like seeing 100 miles an hour. So I think it's interesting, you know, the business of the sport evolving year by year and how that affects how organizations draft, draft, draft. And that's that's where I think we're getting back to that traditional baseball where stolen bases are a thing. Defense is a thing because guess what? Whoa, can't let's go. Any. Fire me up. So defense is becoming a big thing. And I think that you're seeing that, especially in the draft, that if you're taking an infielder, like he, he's got to be able to play his position or just going to be a DH. Or well, guess what? They move him to the outfield. You know, so I think that that's very, very interesting, especially with the anti shifts. Like all of a sudden, like I've, I've had this philosophy personally is that, you know, even when we're recruiting guys as the agency of like, hey, he's going to be a top pick. You know, you're looking two, three years down the road. But it's very interesting when you look at how a year ago, you can put a second baseman in short right field, a shortstop up the middle, a third baseman at shortstop. But now you can't. So what does that mean? Your center fielder has to cover more ground. Your shortstop has to cover more ground. Your second baseman has to play legit defense again. So I think that now like you're looking into schematics of like, hey, can he cover that ground? Hey, how's his arm strength? Hey, what's his speed burst? What's his, you know, what's his range look like? And that's something that three years ago, no one paid attention to. Hey, right. hey, can he hit? All right, we'll put a glove on his hand and we'll position him so he can be two steps. So the game always evolves and kind of levels itself out a little bit. And I think that that's the most interesting thing of where we're at right now and how that changes in the draft and changes in evaluation and changes, you know, what guys are looking for, so to say. I love that. And there's a lot of cool insights within what you just said. And for us, like as a primarily defensive company and and just love the game um, from that perspective, but also obviously fast development, we train a lot of athletes. So if I'm, you know, if I'm a younger athlete, listen to this and, you know, coach H bots in it, like it, this is his day to day. He's speaking with the best minds in the world figuring out how to recruit talent for the future of their organization. It's no small task, right? So to hear that they're they're investing and valuing the athlete again, more so than the guy who could just sit in the box and grip and rip. And then after that, he becomes less of an athlete. I, I'd be very refreshed and rejuvenated. Um, but also, if I'm not taking care of what I need to do as an athlete, my speed, acceleration, first step, mobility, strength, like those are all things back at the forefront, right? It's like, yeah. and, and it, it's, it's, it's not because that's what we do every day, but we've always valued that, right? We, we tell kids all the time, man, if you could play shortstop or center field, you're a guy people are going to come to look to first to see how well or how well you move type of athlete you are, your, your skill set. So I, and it's, I, yeah, I think it's really funny that you say that because like, you know, we always say like, you want to play up the middle catcher, shortstop, um, center fielders. You can do that defensively. You can play anywhere. How many catchers do we see that they want to preserve their body and move them to a first baseman or a corner outfield position? Like let's not forget Bryce Harper was a catcher. Like I when forgot he was, that. Up, he was a catcher. <laughs> then guess what? They said, Hey, you can really hit, you can play right field. And now obviously He's got the arm of, you know, God in the in right field. And guess what? Oh, he gets hurt. We're going to move him to first base. Like he's athletic enough to do everything. But then you also look at guys, you know, like a Max Munce Muncy. They wanted him to hit homers and get bigger. So guess what? He moves to second and third. You know, like there are – they'll take you in an org and say like, hey, you're an elite defender, but we love your bat. We want to see you hit more home runs. We're going to have you put on weight physically, but then move you to third base or move you to left field. They never take a shortstop and say, hey, we, I mean, I mean, sorry, they never take a third baseman and say, hey, we want you to play short. You know, it's always the other way around, you know? That's, and that's a great. Okay. So, yeah. If you're no. looking from like a descending scale, it yeah. starts there, right? And then works its way down. So like, you know, when we're, we're working with our youth athletes. We're always like, hey, like we'll ask them what position they play. But when, when you're 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, man, you play, a, you're a baseball player. You have to see the game from different angles, perspectives, understand the strategy, but also understand how to execute where where you're being asked to play. So youth athletes, be the best athlete you can be and let baseball mm -hmm. or softball decide where you best fit. And that's subjective to the organization, the travel ball team, the high school team, the college yeah. team. Like it, it's all subjective, but the more value you can bring, the more valuable you are. And that's black and white. So be the best athlete you can be. Um, work at all the skills and, and just a, a lot like hitting's hard. Like hitting is good very hitter. Very hard. 
you know, hitting is really hard. That's why it's like, ah, man, every kid really, really, really values that. And I understand why, right? It's, it's definitely right. a premium. But at what point do you say like, all right, like I, I'm good. I'm like good enough at hitting. I understand my bat and ball, how to get the bat to ball skill, right? Like I'm still developing approaches and things like that and getting my timing down for higher velocity pitching. But like, where do you like organize or value hitting versus defense? Well, I think that, you know, hitting is always evolving. You know, it's changing every day. Um, you know, you look at baseball now versus five years ago, like the launch angle, teacher man swing, all that stuff is new. And like everyone's trying to hit home runs and like strikeouts are okay. Like I hate that. I like adjustability. I like to be on plane forever, use the whole field. But the, like, but it's funny because if you now look at like the evaluation of hitters, one of the highest, one of the biggest stats are like good hitters walk. Like what's your walk rate look like? Another one is, you know, your strikeouts. Like, are you striking out less than 30% of your at-bats? Are you putting the ball in play? Because guess what? One thing that I heard from a hitting coach with the Giants, and I love this approach, he told me, he said, you know, we look at the most in the minor leagues. And I was like, what, coach? Like, what do you got for me? He was like, strikeouts. And I was like, why? He was like, because the plate the plate doesn't change, right? But when you go rookie ball, high A, double A, triple A, pitchers get really good, velocity upticks. And guess what? how you command the strike zone, the strike zone doesn't change throughout all the levels. So what you know in the strike zone, guess what? Pitcher are going to make their pitch more. Can you lay off it? Can you battle? Can you see an extra pitch every at bat? And like they track how many pitches you see at per at bat, you know? And to flip the switch in pitching wise, one of the biggest stats they look for in the minor leagues is swing and miss in zone because the hitters are so good. So if your stuff is good enough, you're going to get swings and misses in the strike zone. Like they don't care when you're throwing a slider, three balls off and guys are swinging at it. That's great. But when you go up a level and you go single A, double A, triple A, those hitters get better to lay off that. So those are like two interesting stats that you don't think about. Then also on the hitting side, another quote that this coach said is he said, we take pitches to swing at better ones. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, that fastball that's in on your hands, you're going to break your batter ground out to short. That doesn't help us. So we'll take that because you have three strikes. And we'll try and we'll, you know, try and get that slider over the plate, hit to right center. So, you know, some t pitches we have to take, we can't do damage on it. But to flip the switch, you know, you go three, you go three for 10, right? You fail seven times, you're a Hall of Famer. But what's consistent in those 10 at bats, you still got to go play defense in between every inning. So to take the mental pressure off yourself and play defense, you're going to field more ground balls, catch more fly balls, be in the dirt more than you're going to be in the batter's box. And a lot of guys, like a lot of hitting is, you know, 90% of hitting is just being on time. And then the rest is mental. Like you can have the most beautiful swing in the world. If you're not on time. You can't hit. <laughs> you can have the most beautiful swing on the world. If you don't have an approach, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a, uh, you know, an execution, you're, you're lost. And I see a lot of guys go in the box and I'll turn next, turn next to whoever's sitting next to me. You know, I should go in the dugout now. Like he's already defeating, you know? So there's a lot of stuff. And I think that, Defense gives us a lot of common ground mentally. You think like, you know, when you're out there, you're controlling your heart rate. You're trying to be on time with your feet. You know, um, one of my head coach at Bryant was an all SEC shortstop, second round draft pick, really smart defensive guy and preaches a lot on defense. And the one thing he always said, and I believe this full heartedly in every position, you know, I was a catching coach. I did this with my catchers, you know, first base, outfield, whatever you play defense with your feet. If you are on time with your feet and you create angles and you're moving the right way, you're going to be a good defender. And it's very funny because like, obviously that resonated with me a lot. And you start studying coaches throughout the industry in all of sports. And I read an article with um, about Bill Belichick, obviously one of the best coaches in the, in the business. He found this coach from Hopkins university, smart guy, obviously was a lacrosse player, an all, all conference, all American defender. Hired him as an intern. This guy is now the top um, defensive backs coach with the Patriots. Had like three all pro cornerbacks, right? Guy never coached football before Belichick hired him, right? Why did he hire him to be this intern with the D-backs? Became the assistant. Now he's a head D-backs coach. Had three all pros coached under, uh, played under him. Why? Because lacrosse is playing defense with your feet. Cornerbacks, you can't touch a wide receiver playing defense with your feet. Look at the best shortstops. They're on time with contact in the ground. They're moving on contact. They're not standing still. 
third baseman. I mean, look at how many third basemen were shortstops. Alex Bregman was a shortstop out of the draft, moved to third base. Alex Rodriguez, best one of the best shortstops in the game, moved to third base. Manny Machado moved to third base. So you look at the left side, you have two shortstops over there, but the biggest thing over there is being on time with your feet, you know, being able to move with your feet. Same with the outfielders. Watch them. They're moving. They're changing pitch by pitch. They're moving based on the count. They're, they all look at these cards with scouting reports. Like the scouting reports is just data and percentages that you're going to sell out for. If they beat you the other way, it's going to be less than 20, 30%. You're going to tip your cap. But that being said, if you're not on time, whether it's in the infield, whether it's at the plate, you already have no chance, you know, and it's already the game's moving faster and faster and faster that those little things actually matter. And for the youth, when they study the little things and they get great at the little things, the big picture paints itself. But when you look past the little things and want to just focus on the big things, you're actually setting yourself back. And that starts with training. Wait, I mean, wow. Yeah, there, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to have to go replay all of that. Um, that was just awesome insight. And even at the highest level, like you're talking about MLB, this it's still the same at the youth level. Like we teach a lot of the same principles to the youth. It's just, it's either structured in a different way or it's, it's explained, communicated in a different yeah. way. But I mean, you hear every coach in little league and every coach in high school be on time. Right. And that could be in a third base coaches box to their hitter. It could be um, during practice hitting ground balls. Um, it's just such a, it's one of those pivotal like pillars of baseball. Like you got to be on time to have success, right? Like most hitters, like you said, you would you say 90% of it, what you, th you believe in timing. Time. And I always thought that like I, I coached at the college level for two years and I worked with the hitters. I didn't love coaching hitting so much, but I was like most, you know, mo majority of the time when a hitter would come up to me about like, Man, like I'm not seeing this well. I'm not seeing that well. Am I, am I dropping my backside? Am I flying? I'm like, bro, you're just late. <laughs> yeah. You're just late, man. Like, get your front foot down and and hit the ball hard. Like, and then like, it's just crazy. Like that timing thing is a cascade effect for so many different compensations, and that and that works its way in the infield. If if you're standing upright at uh, at contact you're going to be incredibly chaotic uh, responder, right? Th this is a response to a game, like a, a feedback of our environment in infield play. And that's the ball off the bat. So if you're standing well, upright and you're. Yeah. And also the other thing about the infield play, and I think this is really big, you know, I always say this and, you know, all the coaches I've ever played for the guy that is the smartest guy on the field will always be in the lineup, no matter what his skill set is. He can hit 190, he'll hit ninth, but he'll be at shortstop every day. And that being said, talk about being on time. Take that a step further and a, and a layer further. Being able to communicate plays beforehand. Like being little things, like guy on first, you know, no outs, being like the pitcher, hey, you got me, you got me. You know, knowing that the speed of the runner, like, you know, hey, green on first, yellow at the dish. So like a single in the outfield, you're cutting that right to second base. Like how many guys just free 90, throw that ball to third base, and next thing you know, <laughs> that guy takes the back end now you have second and third, one out, instead of just like, hey, keep the double play in order, get the ball in the middle of the field, and we'll concede that run. Because how many times you see guys, you know, unless you're in the big leagues, you're not really going to throw that guy out of third. Because guess what? Especially if it's, you know, off angle behind him or even down the line or in the corner, but you keep that ball in the middle, now you're one play away from getting double play. But being able to communicate steps going on beforehand, you know, speed of the runner at the dish, speed of the runner on base, situations like – Hey, you know, no doubles or, Hey, we're up four. Let's just get out. It's like those guys are the leaders. The captains are always on the field because it's an extension of the coaching staff between the lines, And that's big. Um, and then the other thing that has to do with timing, this is something I'm a big believer of. And I did this when I was with the catchers, everything we did, we trained hard and we trained fast. Cause what I always say is when you train out of control, little things like when we would do our catch plays catchers every day, when we came in, right. The last set was to get their heart rate up. And we'd turn double plays as catchers, full catcher's gears. And you know why? Love it. But why? Why do you think we turn double plays as catchers? I think it's to get your feet and your hands connected, keep your feet working towards a target, building momentum, um, yeah. being an athlete. Okay. How many times do you watch catchers throw a guy out at second base? Everything you practice on being fundamentally sound goes out the window. 
because the fat the the pitch is always it's never down the middle. It's outside your body. It's up. It's in. It's low. It's never here. But if you train fast, your body moves fast. You create linear movement to second base. But then the transfer, like how many guys fumble the transfer or they don't get a good grip on it? When you practice wow. fast and practice turning and, and double plays, you're not thinking about that. It's second nature. And I always say when we practice fast, in game it slows down. And how many times you see guys train? And they're just training, you know, methodically, effortlessly, just just checking a box. Yep. No, but if you train hard and train fast, muscle memory happens, the mind happens. But then in game it slows down. You've done it a million times. You've done it faster than actually in game. Whereas vice versa, when you don't, the game speeds up on you and you don't make the play. And like, I always like, you know, you know, playoff baseball is the best, but the best players slow the game down in the biggest moments. Like how many times you see guys and it's like, up, oh, been here before, boom, big knock, been here before a double play, diving catch, you know, sell out because they've done it a million times and they're so prepared that it's second nature to them. But the guys, especially at the youth level, prepare, practice, 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 get in their first high school game, their first middle school game, they make two errors and then their head's up. But you look back, hey, did you prepare hard? Did you prepare at the game speed? Now you can't prepare in neutral and then put it in drive. But you got to be going at the highest level and training at the highest level that in game it's slower. Freaking love that. And, and to, to build off the back end of your point, like the game, the biggest delineator or differentiator um, in game speed and levels is uh is game speed sorry right like as you advance levels the game speed increases sometimes twofold threefold fourfold and that's what really truly weeds out players because they're all pretty much talented right like their skill set is somewhat similar to like they're they're within striking distance but the players who played are able to slow that game down by way of preparation whether it be pre-pitch understanding where you're going with the ball if it's hit to you and where that ball is being hit if it's going to change your strategy right like you know that made me think of my my favorite plays in college were a man on first ball took me on the run glove side I didn't have him I uh I'm sorry man on second he's taking a big a big turn around third base I pump fake turn around and back that stuff fires me up because I had a really good coach that knew Hey, it might only happen four times, but how how valuable are those four times going to be? What's the situation? Are we in playoffs? Is it NEC championship? Um, is it to win a series? Like that that's really valuable. So those type of things I look for if I'm recruiting a player, right? Like if I see a kid who understands everything that's happening, potentially he's gonna play quicker because his brain is moving slower, right? Like in between yep. his ears. It's not trafficy, right? It's not like jam traffic. It's flow. It's smooth. It's reactive. Back yep. end to that point about just playing the game fast. I couldn't agree with you more. You watch our practices. We have slow, specialized, um, specific skill, specific work for that individual. Like, yo, you you really struggle with glove presentation. You're not understanding it in between your ears. We need to slow it down so your brain can organize it more efficiently. Right. Because yep. skill acquisition is difficult. You need to give the brain awareness of what you're asking it. And sometimes that happens best in a slower controlled environment. But that that skill only matters, becomes valuable in a crazy chaotic environment, which is game speed. Right. But if you could if you could challenge your players, which we do every damn day that they come, it's chaos. Like if you were a bystander watching some of our infield practices, you'd be like, what the hell is going on? We it's have good. these games we play where it's an incredibly fast, plus, 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 plus runner. As soon as the ball hits the glove, they got to get rid of it, yada, yada, yada. And not only does it allow them to like feel relaxed and, and just go and not think because that's where they play the best, but it will also expose some lanes, glove presentations, throwing slots that you do not have um, efficiency with yet. So I just and love to, that. Well, like, to, go to that. To go to that point, one thing that I, I always preach too is that, you know, I could show you. I can tell you, but until you can feel an adjustment, you won't make it. And that's what you're saying, glove presentation. When you can feel the difference, then there's an adjustment that was made. Showing you videos, telling you, making you think. But if you could, if I get you to think the right way, get you to feel the right way, then you're going to make an adjustment. For instance, like even my catchers, right? We would, we would go over receiving and we had a whole plan that we worked out where 
it started with ping pong balls and they had to catch it with just two fingers and it was slow oh, but for them, oh, it was oh, training oh. their eyes it's getting to be here and then guess what then we go here just these fingers right here and then we go tennis ball here and we go soft baseball here then we'd go ba uh, baseball and a mini glove boom here and then we would go off a of fungo hard short hop with their glove getting underneath it and working underneath the baseball when you do short hops as catchers your eyes and your body have to stay underneath the baseball, like you're backhanding a ball in the hole. But it started with ping pong balls and two fingers, slowly to train their eyes, their mind, and get their trigger the right way. Then we got faster with the tennis ball. And then we went baseball, small glove. Then we went baseball, fungo, actual glove. And then we went to the machine. But it was starting slow, training the eyes and the mind, and then working fast, but then feeling that motion and getting that motion and getting underneath the baseball. I love that. And, and, and the listener take that like, dude, they started with the smallest unit possible, the lightest unit possible. If you guys tried that at home, just to catch a ping pong ball with one hand, it would be incredibly challenging. Um, but I think coach to your point, man, everyone wants to just do the game speed. Like everyone just wants to do that. They see that they want it on TV. They want to do it, but man, it don't work like that. Right. Like you can't sprint before you crawl. Right. Like there's got to be progressions and that stuff's hard. You got to tuck your ego and understand that you stink right now. Who cares? Work on it. You'll get uh, incrementally better. And, and if that's, if this is the game you want to play, that's what you got to do. Any sport life, right. You got to be okay with failing just to, to grow and develop. Um, coach looking at infielders, like you got to get out there on the road. You've been, you basically live on a plane. Talk to our viewers a little bit or listeners about, hey, if you're a high school infielder, college infielder, or incoming freshman in high school, you know, what, what is standing out to you? What, what are some things you're measuring? Um, I think that a lot of it, like we just said, a lot of it's like the elites of the elites. You know, the guys that are playing the SEC, the guys that are playing the ACC, the guys that are playing professionally, minor leagues, everywhere. They're on time. They put their nose down and go get everything. They're, you should see the pregame glove work. You know, you see like the Ron Washington stuff, like that's legit. They all have ponds as they're sitting there on one knee, working through the ball, forehand, backhand, side to side with their feet. There's like, there's an hour of preparation before BP. And then there's BP. And then there's fungos. And then there's in-game. So a lot of it is, you know, the size and physicality. And a lot of that, you know, even like I'll put my agency hat on for a minute and talk about that and the fact that, you know, Playing baseball in the minor leagues, it's great. It's hard. It's a grind. You know, you're all over the country. You're you're playing for that net to get to the next level. And then you get to the next level. And then it's the next level. Like professional baseball is the hardest sport to make it, so to say. There's four or five levels. Hundred percent. Before you get a chance. But in those levels, so to say, the off season is more important than the season. You know, are you working with the right hitting guy? Are you working with the right defensive guy? Are you lifting? Because a lot of that's on your own. You don't have a team like in college where it's like, hey, we're in our dead time. You have lifts five days a week with two strength coaches, million dollar gym. You're doing this like, no, you're on your own. It's like, hey, you're waking up. You need to fire yourself up to push yourself at the gym, not check, check a box. Like the guys that are making jumps that are getting to the next level, they're doing all their arm care as a pitcher. They're doing their arm care as a, as a position player. They're making a thousand throws from short. They're going and playing, getting fungos every day. They're hitting with it with a, a hitting coach. They're hitting on their own. They're going over their film from last year. They're talking to their player development guy like, hey, what do you see? How can I get better? You know, they're eating the right way. Like That's the hardest thing is like you talk about like being a professional athlete. It's a job and at 24-7, 365, every calorie that goes in your body, every protein shake, you know, every every meal you have is calculated. You know, what do you need to do? Is it this offseason gain weight? Is it lose weight? Is it getting faster? Guess what? Getting faster you're out there running hills. You're out there running sprints. You're out there doing single leg isolated squats. You're out there. That's on you. Like there's no, there's no team around you those six months when you're on your own. Then you come into camp and spring training and you're getting right back to tires moving and you have a sprint for six weeks. And then it's like, I got to impress 15 different guys. And you go in there and then you're playing against other guys that are playing for their, like their opportunity. So there's a lot that goes into it, but you know, I would say for younger guys, especially college guys that want to play at the next level or, or high school guys that want to play in college, like you got to look in the mirror almost and really ask yourself, do you really want it? Because like wanting it is a lot more than what just happens on the field. Because think about it, we just talked about it 10 minutes ago, failing seven out of 10 times, you're a really good player. 
It's like, how are you dealing with the mentality? How are you dealing with the mental side? Are you pushing yourself and driving yourself in the gym? Like mom and dad want it more for you because it's your dream. They want to see you succeed. Every parent wants their kids to achieve their goals. But having that sacrifice, like, hey, man, I got to get my lift in today. Hey, I got to do my homework. Hey, I got to take my ground balls. Hey, I got to work on my footwork. And the other thing also, and I think this is something that is very, very big and it's very undervalued, but reach out to people that are at that next level. Like if you're at a gym, if you're at a train, you see a kid who's a starting shortstop in, I don't know where you are at San Diego, go talk to him. Say, hey man, what helped you get here? And most of those guys, especially the college guys, like they're very receptive to talk to kids. I mean, look, with my organization, you look at the shortstops I have this year, it's, you know, Oregon, Mississippi State, Marist, Central Florida, Rhode Island. And like those kids all come here and I tell them the number one rule I have with the organization is talk to the kids. They do 25 school reading days where they go into a classroom, read to the kids, oh, then do a Q&A. That. And then like we invite all the little to come to the ballpark for a game. But like I tell them all the time, if you're not on the field playing, if you're in the bullpen, if you're sitting along in the dugout along the fence and the kids are talking, I want you to talk to them. Because one day that kid who you're talking to is going to be in my dugout. He's going to be on the field. But like any advice you give him, that's gold. Because the game's changing every day. But what your process is might not be good enough for me. But if you tell one kid and he takes 70% of what you said and it works, you made that kid better. And especially nowadays with social media, with videos, with you know the, the resource that are out there. When you and I were playing, none of that didn't exist. There was no Instagram. No. There was no Twitter. There was, and nowadays... It's crazy to say this, but in the coaching world, to get noticed and get to that next level. I mean, I applied for a job with the Astros three years ago. They said, hey, do you have any videos and content of you coaching? And I didn't have a content <laughs> page. And they asked me what? in an interview with in the Astros player development if I had a page that showed my, uh, my, my drills. And I said, no, I don't have one. But nowadays, coaches are getting seen by showing what they do. And it's all out there as a resource for kids. And you might watch – a 10 minute shortstop video and say, Hey, there's about two minutes that I like. That's great. You learn something new, but there are resources out there. But a lot of guys get closed mind. It's like, no, it's not where like, how do you know? You might say, wow, I felt that that felt different. That felt great. in finding that angle, I didn't know I could do that and work on my left foot to get there and make that play in the hole. So I think that, you know, especially for younger guys to be open-minded, you know, I tell kids all the time when they're like, you know, I feel great. I'm like that. I'm like, dude, your finished product, you will never be the best version of yourself until you are standing on a podium in the hall of fame. And if you, and if you think you are, someone's out, someone's out working you and you're someone's better than you. But if you have that hunger, that, that open-mindedness, that drive to be better every single day and see the guy next to you, Hey man, I respect you, but I'm going to beat you. You'll constantly evolve and get better. I mean, look at, you know, I find it so interesting. You look at guys like Clayton Kershaw, Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, guys that are older, but having longevity in this game is hard. It's really freaking hard. But they keep going out there and having success. And, like, you know, I love as, like, watching pitchers, and I'll take, like, Kershaw, for example, who will give up four runs in the first. And you're like, oh, like, he's done. And next time it's a sixth inning. Like, there's so much value in getting your team and saving your bullpen and giving your team a chance to win when you don't have your best stuff. Or even you look at, you know, guys that in defensively, that are over 15, but still making diving plays, saving runs in the hole, being that guy in the field that's the leader in the clubhouse. There's so much value to that. Where we're especially at the, the amateur level, you're over 15, your head's down, your step late, you're not diving in the hole, that ball is through, and you could have saved two runs. But that's the difference between professional and being an amateur. And I think there's so much value in learning that. And kids don't really want to learn that. I love that. And and it's a lot easier just to be a victim, right? Like the game's yeah. hard. Oh my God, ball took a bad hop or, oh my God, I'm swinging well, but I'm hitting it right. No one cares, right? Like no one cares, man. Like we're all in the same boat. You got to figure it out or get off the boat, right? Like mm -hmm. um, it's, that's where we're struggling a lot. The big, one of the bigger things I see is like, you know, good kids, lack of accountability, good yep. kids. They're always a victim. Good kids. They always have excuses. I understand they're good kids, but we got to continue to mentor them. Like, yo, no one, no one cares when you get older, right? Like it's, th there's a million of you, but the coach or scout's going to want the guy who's accountable. Like, yo, I did great. That's on me. I did horrible. That's on me. Like take accountability 
for your good and bad performances because we know the bad's going to be there. Don't act know, like it's fantasy. And talk about accountability. One thing that, you know, I push this a lot, that like hustle never slumps. You know, I've seen a lot of guys that are slumping and then put a bunt down, they beat it out. Next thing you know, they get five hits on the week. You know, 100%. Like that. But here's the other thing that's very interesting that, you know, people, they don't they don't understand this. Scouts, college, and professional, they're getting every single metric. And one of the biggest ones is your time down the line. And there are guys that, you know, nowadays especially, you're slumping, right? Let's say you're one for 15. Every At most high-level colleges, you might get out 14 times, but 12 of them were exit below 110 because there was a line drive, and that track man data is recorded. So you may not have gotten a hit or – double or a home or anything but now there's data references and how hard you hit the ball and the other thing is how hard you run like they're 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 clocking you down the line and there are guys when they dog it they note that there are guys like hey he's struggling but he's still busting it down the line like that's the guy i want to invest because you got to remember especially nowadays like when you get picked you're not just getting picked as a baseball player they're investing in you as a human how you're going to you know carry the organization how you're going to represent yourself i mean now especially with all these deals and endorsements and stuff, are you going to be a good representation of the organization? And all those factors come into play in evaluating these kids, especially in college now too. Like how are you going to walk around and, and, you know, wear that, that logo on your chest? Is it going to be something we're going to be proud of? Are you going to bring the next recruit in? Are you going to make us look good on the national scale? Especially now. I mean, I think like 70 or 80% of the college baseball is on ESPN plus, I mean, our ratings and our followings are going through the roof, like college baseball, that it's all time high, which is great. You know, I always say the passion in college baseball is unmatched. And you don't know until you actually watch the game. Then go to a game and see it. I mean, there's value in just team guys. You know, guys that may not have that stuff to be the next level or an all-conference player, but without them, you don't win. And there's so much to be said about that. And that comes into culture and coaching and being coachable. How you're doing when no one's looking? How you're doing when you're struggling? Like, I always said this. As a coach, I found it more rewarding to work with guys who are struggling and help them through the mental blocks, help them do this. I mean, like, look, when you're the best player on the team, when you're hitting 350, everyone's giving you a high five. Like you can do no wrong. Like everyone loves Life's you. But good. The kid, but the kid that's hitting 190 and can't get out of his own way, like he's in a hole in the bench and we have six coaches. Only one of us is going to get through to him, you know? And like the best advice coaching wise was, Hey, you're going to say the same thing seven different ways, but one way is going to stick to this certain kid, whichever it may be. And working with that kid and watching him get out of a hole and be successful, there's so much development in that when it comes to the kid, the person, life, baseball. Like it's more than just trying to hit a curveball. There's so much more to getting out of that that system. Then guess what? That's going to help the kid in life. But you sit there on the bench and by the 30th game, the 40th game, his sophomore year, the next kid that's struggling, you watch that kid walk down the bench, put his arm around, be like, "Hey, I've been there. You're okay. You're like this," and that's what coaching is all about. That's what you love to see. That's the development and the culture and that personal drive that we just talked about that kids need to have. And it's accountability amongst each other. And not just the accountability of success, but the accountability like, hey, my teammate's struggling. You can either be selfish, say, it's okay, I got his job, I'm great. You're like, no, like it takes all of us to push the boat. I'm going to walk down the bench and put my arm around him and talk to him and say, hey, I was there six months ago. Hey, I was there two weeks ago. Like, Let's see, like, is our approach, like, whatever it may be. But there's so much value in that that kids nowadays get lost in that cloud. Again, I just did 50 push-ups, Coach. You're firing me up. But back <laughs> to that point of just being a good teammate, because, like, a lot of kids, I just think in this modern-day, like, showcase metric skill, I, I like, individual classification of tiering players, ranking players – it becomes very like pro ball, like where it's all, we're just trying to get a promotion and like, we're losing the beauty and magic of the game. Like the magic of pulling together a nucleus um, and, and going to war with our teammates. Like it's about that first and foremost, a lot of what you just mentioned is all not, none of it's about the individual. It's always been about the bigger, the bigger picture, the group, the team. And I think a lot of kids are starting to lose sight of that. And it's, it's saddening to me. Um, and, and I always try and I'm in a different setting. I'm more in the private. We have a lot of groups though, and our groups are all units, right? We're there to help each other out. When we speak to each other, it's not above or it's not below. And, uh, I think that's beautiful because listen, baseball is going to end one day, right? That's why I think the good coaches are so passionate about creating good men 
and good young women because the game is going to end one day. And then who are you? Like you no longer have batting average next to you, ERA, home runs, like fielding percentage. Like you're, you're the human. You're, you're Drew Walsh. Who are you? Yeah. Are you still a good person? Or are you just, are you that jerk off on the field who just cared about yourself? And, and no one, funny, like, people remember I, I, that. Yeah, no. And I always say this, like, especially with summer ball, like you look at, you know, my organization, right? 40 guys on the roster, SEC, ACC, Pac-12. Then you got like the Atlantic 10, the NEC, like all these guys come together. Right. And we always, like, I always do something strategically and you can call me crazy for this, but it worked. <laughs> So I always say, look, I was like, you know, first couple of weeks, we got to know each other, how we play X, Y, and Z, right? So you guys will not start winning until you care about each other. So the second week, I always make go on a 10 hour bus ride, we go to Vermont, play doubleheader, come back. You want to see a group bond quicker? You put them on a bus where they can't go anywhere. They get to know each other. <laughs> and the, at the end of the summer, I always tell them, no matter what happens, like this is always going into the playoff stretch. You're never going to remember your stats. You remember the memories. You remember the people and the amount of those guys that are in each other's weddings that have been friends now for 10 years after playing with each other, whether they were at university of Southern Mississippi or they were at Boston college, like those memories last longer than stats and how you helped each other through those times. It's valuable. All of this is valuable in making like what you said, good men and you play better when you care. Why we're here. We're here through baseball. Like, we're here through baseball. We have so many memories of places, trips, restaurants, not so much fields. Like, like this is all through, like, people on our wedding parties, like, yeah. are, are from baseball. Um, it's just amazing. It's way bigger than us. Coach, this has been amazing. We're doing a part two. Like, this is happening. Coach H. Bod, like, the amount of passion, insight. Um, and knowledge you bring is just it's awesome it's refreshing and you have a lot of hats so we only went over a few hats today um we'll get in we didn't even talk about your weightlifting hat yet but <laughs> coach where can our listeners find you get more information like i don't know if you're incredibly active on instagram and this is your challenge to start because i think you're holding back and being selfish i think you need to get on there more often or at least come on this podcast more often but where can they find you uh, Eric H by the two five is my Instagram. Uh, I use that kind of like a scrapbook, but then, uh, uh, my Twitter is, you know, Eric H by two five. So pretty much you can find me on either one, but a lot of it, uh, you know, and you can follow the ocean state waves. It's the organization that, you know, that, that I run and you can follow us along for the summer. Lightning round just made this up in my head. Where is it. one place every prospective athlete should be to find recruiters? Two word answer. Dig it. Dig it. Awesome. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Uh, last one. What's one thing that will get you crossed off a recruiting list? How you handle failure. Drop the mic. Coach Eight Spot, you are the man. Thank you so much for your time. We will Absolutely. certainly have you back on the episode soon. You have a great day, all right? Thanks, brother. Appreciate it.